Good evening. Welcome to the Spiritual But Not Religious show. I'm your host, George Lewis. The Spiritual But Not Religious show is brought to you by the Spiritual Broadcasting Network, SBN. Uh, SBN was started to be to bring you the voices of the spiritual community. Uh, right as of this point, we haven't had any real central source. Uh, we got all over the place as far as the spiritual community is concerned, especially if you're spiritual but not religious. Uh, there just isn't any real gathering place for us. Uh, as a matter of fact, spiritual but not religious, uh, we don't go to church. We have a higher power. We believe in a God of some sort um, in various ways, and uh, and we're working at becoming the, the voice for that community. I have two really I have, not, I, have, I have two good guests next week, two great guests. I've got Becky Clark. Becky Clark lives in uh, in London, or just not, not London, I'm sorry. She lives in, in, in the U.K., and Becky is a young woman. Uh, I believe she just turned 18. She's going to be an author, going to be a writer, and she suffers from albinism. And the, the uh, amount of uh, prejudice and... Uh, and, and difficulties that that causes for her, uh, you know, people making fun of her and so forth. So we're going to have her on for a few minutes to talk with her about albinism, how we might be able to make people aware of uh, the difficulties with albinism. Uh, and uh, after that, we've got a, a, an excellent guest going to talk with us about whether or not you're possessed. Wayne Brewer uh, wrote a great little book here. And uh, it's very, very interesting. I, I know the, the the title of it kind of like tends to put you off a little bit, but it's it's super interesting, and there's a lot more to this than than what meets the eye. My guest tonight is a, a really super lady uh, who has really tackled a, a one of the more difficult areas in in uh, in our lives. She's a uh, a, a, a therapist. She's a uh, she has a PhD. Linda Savage. She has written a book called Reclaiming Goddess Sexuality, The Power of the Feminine Way. And I'll tell you what, in, in reading her book, I have, I have, uh, I use a highlighter and I have, on every page almost, I've highlighted something that's, uh, that's really, really powerful for, uh, for future use and, and for this evening. Uh, I guess Tom, we if we got Linda uh, on the line, on the phone, we, lost the video. we lost the video. Video's That's done. unfortunate. Unfortunately, Linda's had some technical problems, and uh, let me let me bring Linda on. Hi, Linda. Have we got you? Um, not sure because uh, I don't see you anymore. No. Oh, you don't see me. Okay. Well, what you the, what you do is do uh, you know how to refresh your browser? Actually, I'll tell you what, the, the, the truth of the matter, uh, Linda, you would be better off if you don't see me because there's a lag. Okay. And, and, if, you're, and if you're watching, it's going to be a problem. I want to get your volume up a little bit I'm, more as here. As long as you can see me and that's good, then I don't mind. Well, you know, unfortunately, your modem must have kicked out because your video is not there. All we have is audio, and at this point uh, in, the, uh, in the show, we really can't get you back on, so... I'm really sorry about that. I was looking forward to being able to uh, to, to to see you face to face myself. Yeah. I, yeah. I've really been looking forward to this, Linda. I I have uh, devoured your book. Uh, you know, I want to want to tell our audience a bit about uh, about the way the book is written. L Linda's a PhD, and and so she has the capacity to write to to intellectuals. And you know, sometimes a book that's written to intellectuals can be very very difficult to read. But she chose what I know is the hard way for authors, and that's to, to, to really bring it down to where it's really readable by everybody out there. And uh, she's done a great job with it. It's a, it's a super read. What I hope to do tonight with Linda is, is make you aware of how valuable what she's written here is, how it can help you, and how it can make your life better. I can't even begin to tell you how much you, you should go over and purchase this book. And, and we're not trying to sell books tonight, I, I guarantee you. But uh, 
and you can get it on Barnes and Noble, Amazon.com, you know, the standard places. It's Reclaiming Goddess Sexuality. Linda also does uh, uh, work, uh, one-on-one kinds of work, and we'll get her phone number and her uh, web page address up. Tom will put it up in the chat room, and we'll have uh, Linda uh, talk about it. So, Linda, with a, we, I guess we have the introduction out of the way. Uh, be, uh, before I begin, I, I am, you know, like so uh, impressed with what you've done here. What I, what I would really like to be able to do, and I need your help with this, and if, and, uh, and that is, I'd like to do a, a follow-up show on, on this, with a male counterpart to what you've written. There is there any such a thing out there? Anybody that you know of? It's uh, written by uh, Spiritual Sex, you mean? Well, that's, that that really complements your work, so that we can we can speak to the males on the next show. As, well, as I have a couple of ideas. Yeah, um, great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Well, you and I will talk about those about those later. Yeah. So w- let's let's give the audience an idea of who you are, so that uh, and where you come from, so that. So they can really understand uh, the value of your work. One of the things that I observed pretty quickly was the fact that uh, you're talking from your experience. You've actually done the work. You work with people in this in this area on a regular basis, and that's impressive and and uh, really essential for for any kind of recovery from. Uh, uh, in the sexual area, so let's give us a little idea, a brief idea of, uh, of uh, you know where you come from, how you got into this, and and then we'll take kind of take it from there. Okay. Well, I I come from a, a upper middle class Boston family, so uh, highly educated, all that good stuff. Uh huh. Began to get interested in uh, spiritual seeking in the seventies. Right. And that's what I write about in the book. The thing that began my journey into looking into spiritual sexuality was actually a dream that I had at the community of Finthorn on the summer solstice. Okay, well, I was going to ask you to tell that to tell that story anyhow early on. I know you, you, you're, you're kind of late in the book when you bring your story in, but I think it really sets the stage for tonight's show. Maybe, maybe you can just give us in, in real detail uh, what happened for you with that dream. Yeah, um, I'll try to kind of make it simple. Okay. What what occurred is that I'd uh, gone into a spiritual community, decided that celibacy was the way to go. That was very popular at that time. Right. And then um, was traveling to Finthorn, which is still a, a mecca for a lot of spiritual seekers. Absolutely. And on the summer solstice, I had a dream, which is really more like a waking dream. Uh-huh. And um, participated in a ritual, an ancient ritual, uh, which I later researched and found it was called the Great Marriage. Uh-huh. Uh, marriage not referring to forever and after, you know, you're still together. But, to death uh, do us part, right. Of a very high nature. Uh-huh. And it left me profoundly moved to where several days later I was still feeling the energy. And um, I went back to the community, eventually went back to school to get a Ph.D., and didn't know I was going to specialize in this area, but was more or less led into specializing in sex therapy from the very beginning. Right. So once I got licensed as a psychologist and all that good stuff, I worked with couples primarily. I worked with individuals as well. And more and more, I became fascinated by how do we make something work long term? Right. Because... Uh, sex is great, everybody's having a good old time, well not everybody, but many people, but nobody knows how to connect to a partner after the early uh, bells and whistles stage. Absolutely. Yeah, and so I was always interested in how can we help men and women actually have a connection that isn't just about what I call the tingly genital thing. Right. And so I began (coughs) to want to write about a way that works for women because more than anything, I saw that women were getting sort of frustrated and bored, and it just wasn't working for them. I mean, the whole 70s was about positions, and let's teach everybody how to have an orgasm, and it, it really wasn't working. Right. So when I <clears throat> began to research, I was looking into these cultures that pre-exist the structures that we've had in place for roughly around 4,000 years, uh, roughly that. But they're called uh, roughly that. 
but they're called patriarchal because they were cultures where men were at the top of the heap and women were fairly at the bottom. Right. <clears throat> so as I began to do the research, information just sort of came and came and came around how sexuality was dealt with and how women were dealt with in these cultures that didn't see women as second-class citizens. And the fact is, sexuality was very connected to spirituality. It wasn't, wasn't ever seen as separate from it. And that women were considered highly sexual beings, and their power of giving birth was honored. And, you know, there was a lot of devotion to the feminine. Right. So that's what inspired me to write. And since then, I have been encouraging, empowering women. I do Awaken Your Inner Goddess seminars. We just do a lot of things to help women reconnect to their divinity. Because that's what got cut out of the picture. Okay, when you talk about getting reconnected to their divinity, a as I understand it, in, in, as part of it, a big part of it in, in your book, uh, what you, what you tr what we do here is we change a viewpoint, but also uh, in doing this, you change the desire or the, and bring desire back for the for the uh, for the sexual act. Is, am I right? Well. It's a little more complicated. What I'm doing is giving women a reason to want to reconnect with their own sexual energy. Exactly, right. You know, uh, the women are bored with, you know, intercourse-based sex. Well, that, that's my point. In other words, <laughs> to, you know, to bring that desire back to, to have some kind of a, of a sex life that's better. You know, one thing for sure. If all we got to do is look out there to what's going on, and and we have, you know, what fifty percent attrition in marriages, t mm -hmm. you know, today something isn't working. I, I, a lot of things aren't working. No, my whole life I've watched it fall apart. Not only in the outer world with my friends and family and and people and relatives, but in my own life. Yeah. Yeah, it just hasn't. It's, it's you know something needs to change. And, yeah, for and me as well. I mean, I certainly have a lot of personal experience finding things. That did not work. <laughs> right, exactly. Blind, blind alleys are learning what what doesn't work, and now it's time to learn what does work. Right. But I was always motivated to find a way to make it work. The women that I wrote this book for are the ones that will say, "I don't care if I ever have sex again." They're so shut down and turned off, and, and it, to me, it's a tragedy. Oh, it's a real tragedy. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, they lose a real vital energy. You, you, life you, force. you, you exactly. Well, you make a statement in in your book that says that sexual energy is the most tra powerful transformer available in our bodies. Right. That's a right. huge Thank statement. That's my Huffington Post. <laughs> right, exactly. That's where, the, yeah, okay. it's a transformer of energy. We're basically bringing in and uh, accessing very high states of, um, I don't even know what to call it. I don't know if we have a name for it. Well, well, you know, I, I first encountered this back in, I was like 26 years old. Wow. And, and I read a book, believe it or not, called Think and Grow Rich by oh, yeah. Napoleon oh, yeah. Hill, right? Uh -huh. well, well, that book talked about taking the sexual energy, and I had plenty of it in those days, and transmuting it into whatever you were doing. You, yes. that, that ener and so I, I know that there's real transformation available through that, right. that energy in my own personal experience. Right, right. And it, it can be used for healing. It's used to rejuvenate your own body. But here's the key. When we say these things, people tend to picture a specific act. Sex is something you do with somebody else, and usually it's a very limited thing that you do. Yes. But when we talk about transforming in our bodies, our healing, making it um, powerful for us as human beings, it doesn't have to be partner sex. Right. It doesn't even have to be the kind of thing we think of when we use that word. That's how limiting it's been in the Western culture. Absolutely. It's energy that we can move in our body, and we don't even have to do any kind of self-stimulation for this energy. I mean, you have to practice some pretty high, uh, it's not meditation, it's really working with your body, but it's still possible to have all kinds of orgasmic energy without anything that we would recognize in the West as called sex. And the real key is to bring your will into this, yes. in your intent. Yes, absolutely. You know, and... and for me, it's about looking at this whole um, wonderful room of treasures that are available so you can have partnered sex when it is connected and it's not being done just to get to sleep or, you know, just to get off, which is what our, where our culture goes with it. So you can have that. You can also have your own spiritual experience with, with self-stimulation. You can also use the energy, run the energy 
as you work with people, as you do, and again, it's not this perverted idea that people have. It's not genital sex. It's really just energy that goes through your body. Right. Yeah. So tell me, w in order to, to learn how to access that, I, I, would, does that require therapy? Is there, you know, do you have some kind of a, a, a CD, something that, you know, some way that, that uh, people can do this on their own? Absolutely, people. I mean, there, there's plenty of books written about spiritual sex. Some of them are, in my opinion, way too detailed and too arduous to even get through. Right. Um, I do have a CD. I made it specifically for, it's actually meant for women, but the exercise that's the sort of middle of, the, there are three guided meditations in the middle one, is instructions with um, uh certain physical movements, breathing, and visualization that actually allows you to access that energy. Okay. And, and, um, and that's available on your website? Yeah, it's available on my website and also Amazon.com. It's okay. called Maiden Mother Wise Woman Reclaiming Our Sexuality. <coughs> okay. And um, David Data, who's also uh, writes uh, about spirituality and sexuality, has exercises as well in his books. So. And, and what's that name again? Uh, his name is David Data. It's spelled D. I-E-A. Okay. Yeah. All right, great. So if you're out there and you're, you're thinking about uh, giving this a try, you want to find out about that energy, there's a couple of sources that, that will help you. You know, one of the things, the other thing, you just said so many really powerful things, things that really spoke to me at any rate, uh, that, that, uh, that I really understand as being true. And that's, that's important. You know, self-help books, there's plenty of them out there that sound like they ought to work, seemed like they ought to work, but by God, they just don't somehow or other really work for us. Yeah. One of the things you said is that every loving relationship is an invitation to transform. Mm -hmm. and it's our task and our joy to accept the mystery and surrender to that experience. What, what, what do you mean by that? Wow. Well, almost every word there definitely needs yeah, a there's a level of understanding. Uh, surrender, for example. Let's just take that one. Okay. Um, it's, it's an experience that you have when you go to sleep. It, you know, that's a form of surrender. But this kind of surrender has to do with allowing yourself not to have a script, not to be in control, not to have in your head a performance you want to, you know, you're not doing this for anybody else, but you're, you're literally allowing yourself to go deep into an experience. So that's w one of the meanings of uh, the several words in there. Right. And then the other is that relationship is in itself a mystery. Oh, I mean, for we sure. have lots and lots of good information and techniques, and I teach them with couples all the time. But ultimately, there's a kind of mystery that we have to let go and allow. You know, it's 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 like the law of attraction. You know, the allowing some things to come to you. Right. The same with relationship. Now that doesn't mean that you don't work with it, you don't do communication, and you don't do all. But ultimately, there's a kind of accepting that this is a, a journey, really, and uh, and then get fascinated by that. One of the things that I see as a, a block for uh, what I think is our a good many people is because of the the boredom. Oftentimes, uh, we'll go into a sexual fantasy. And not even be with the partner, mm -hmm. and all of these things it seems to me can't work unless we're in the moment and with the person that we're with. Being fully present. Well, here's here's the deal. I mean, to me, in a long-term relationship, sometimes you can just have a fun sexual experience, and if you want to use fantasy, as long as your partner's aware that that's happening and it's not a big issue between the two of you. Right. That's fine. You know, I mean, uh, let's face it. Sometimes we're busy. We don't have the time to create sacred space and and get connected and do all the things that really make um, for a much more transformational experience. Right. So if you're looking at having the time and wanting to really move into a sort of timelessness where you can create this, um, then you have to do some things to make it, make it possible. Right. And one of them is to bring yourself into the present. It means letting go of not only your stuff, but the issues in the relationship. It's, it's really shedding all of that and creating the atmosphere, you know, sort of creating the magic circle. And then when you go into it, you are relating as the essential lover that you are. Right. And 
all the ways in which you know how to connect, the breathing, the holding each other, the eye gazing, the allowing each of you to move into a very sacred place and right. your presence. And you're right. In those cases, going into your head and running a fantasy takes you somewhere else. What well, seems, well, seems to me that the, the idea here is to connect with divinity. Yes. Okay. And, and as I understand divinity is that Divinity only exists in the now moment, in the present, That's not right. in the past, not in the future. And so That's if I'm right. going in either of those directions, I can't, I'm not going to be able to get what I'm after at all. That's right. So thinking about what your next move is, trying to figure out if your partner likes it, all of that stuff has to go away. Right. Got to, it has to block the whole, the whole yeah. process. Well, that, yeah. that in itself is quite a, a, a learning process. Uh, you know, there's some... Well, so that's where the surrender is. Yeah, because we're really habituated. Uh, at oh, least, yeah. You know, we're, we're very performance-oriented. Our whole culture's model for sex is performance-oriented. Right, absolutely. And it screws everybody. <laughs> you know, I work with couples that have been together a long time and also older couples, and the men may have liked the performance model in their younger years, but it's not working for them as they age either. Yeah, right. So, and I love it because as we age, men and women have much better opportunities of working with this and coming together in time and place so that it's really more about what what they want to create as opposed to some, you know, porn script that they'd be running. Right, or some some need to procreate. That, you know, yeah. that part is, is pretty well done. Well, procreative sex can be actually pretty magical if you are fully so, present in the moment. But <laughs> Yeah, well, and, and I think that's the key, isn't it, being present? When you know you're bringing in a, a, a being into, into spi in, from spirit into uh, the world, it's an amazing high. I, I've had that experience where I knew I was conceiving in the moment of conceiving, and and I, I wouldn't knock that. <laughs> well, I'm not, and, I, and I'm not at all. And I, and I see that for a woman. What I was talking about is at, at that stage, you know, the testosterone is running pretty high in right, the male's body. Right, right. And, and, and that kind of like changes the, the, right. the whole thing, the whole idea of any kind of, uh, uh, yeah. We, yeah, it's, it's very driven, you know, it's like, okay, let's get it on and get off. And, and um, there's nothing wrong with it. It just isn't going to yeah, no. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I think sometimes that's, you know, like a pretty satisfying thing if both people yeah. are, you know, if that's, yeah, if that's, that's what you're that, looking well, you for. You know, hey, we're just going to have a nice time and that's it, yeah. Right. So one of the things that, that you talk about in, 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 your, uh, in your therapy treatment model is that it resembles a shamanic journey mm -hmm. and that it, reframing is a, is a big part of that. What, what, tell us what you mean by shamanic journey and how you use reframing in that. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I actually uh, am working with a teacher myself who is a shaman. Uh -huh. And a male lot or, male of what or I learn is I uh, informs my work. So is that my are you working with a male or a female? A male. Okay. Believe it or not, a male. Yeah. And uh, he's a very balanced, very balanced in his masculine and feminine, and um, I totally trust the work I do. So Right. Um, um, it surprised me, too, because I work a lot with the goddess, and, and I have groups that I do with women and so on. So this is, in a way, a nice balance for me. Sure. But uh, shamanic journey, I'm not going to do a great job in describing it because... Uh, yeah, just do the best you can. And yeah, yeah. It's really, it's really what, what I said, and it, it's transformational experiences where you go into a uh, deep, um, deep dimensional place. You're both fully present, and you're also on many dimensions, and you have experiences, things come and go, you sort of let them go, but it's like a journey. But um, it's your own experiences that are coming, and, and you're allowing yourself to recognize, you know, whether it's uh, past issues or a new awareness of the universe or whatever it is, that you're basically allowing yourself to have experiences surrendering to the feminine, which is the unconscious. Right. And... As you and when you say that, you're talking about both male and female surrendering to the oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, journeying is, is, um, is, is hard to describe, but essentially you're taking yourself out of um, the physical world into more dimensional world. Right. And you can use drumming. You can use uh, all kinds of ways that people allow themselves to go in there. But what happens when you consciously choose it and then when you're uh, through the journey, you integrate it into your life. Uh, to me, relationships really are a, a, an ultimate journey because 
you know, things will happen, and you work with them, and you come from your highest self, and you keep working on it. Right. And it does take work, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it does. It takes but, desire. You know, people grow when I say that, and um, you can make it hard by resisting. <laughs> right. Or you can just go in with telling the truth, getting present, being able to say what's going on right now inside of you, you know, being fully present to that. Most of us in relationships have a hard time saying, okay, here's what's coming up for me at this moment. You know, we want to point the finger or tell the other person what we think of them rather than reveal more about ourselves. Well, and I think that's where the whole idea of work comes in because I, yes. because it's not really work. It's about what you talked about earlier, and that's about reframing this whole yeah. thing. Yeah, it's personal self-disclosure. Right. And the only thing about reframing, this is one of the things I teach a lot in communication skills, is if you are saying it from a critical voice, right. you know, I, this doesn't work for me because you do blah, blah. Um, it's not going to come across in any way that's going to be useful to either person because the other person will get defensive. And, and, that, goes, and that goes for everything in a relationship. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, I'm yeah. a firm believer in teaching uh, communication skills, and all of them have to do with how to minimize the defensiveness of the person you want to communicate with. Well, it's certainly the sexual encounter is about communication. Absolutely. Yeah, totally Absolutely. about communication. It's about being fully present and able to move with or say what needs to be said in the moment. Right. And that's not easy to do. It's easy when we get together in the beginning because we're on a kind of brain high, literally. We've got dopamine, norepinephrine firing in our brain. And so we have those flowy experiences where... You know, you come up for air and wonder who was who, you know. Yeah, exactly. You yeah, just the merge. In those early sexual experiences, which for a lot of us are like, wow, I'd really like to have that in my long-term relationship, is that it is based on literally uh, um, uh, ecstatic brain chemistry that doesn't last. So your inner pharmacy is kind of taking care of all that for yes, you. Yes, exactly. And even then, for some couples, that doesn't ever quite work for them. But um, right. The, it's similar to learning a practice of meditation. You know, you can have an amazing experience sometime out in the desert, and then to begin to track back to that experience, you're going to have to develop some skill and some discipline and, and kind of get there um, a little more consciously. You know, the, the gift is the early experience, and then you're going to have to figure out a way back to that. And, uh, and that's what I teach. I teach a lot about um, how do you move into a space where you can with yourself fully present now, not that you're kind of imagining this person, because when we meet somebody, we project that they're ideal, you know. Right. Once we've been with somebody a long time, we know all their flaws, and that's where the work is, is shedding that at the times that you want to move into sacred space and have a spiritual sex experience. Well, yeah, not only do, do we know their flaws, but so often the, the couples are bound in that power struggle. And, oh, and yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's a lot of the work I do when I'm working with couples. Uh, that one is a fairly lower chakra issue. And right. what I teach is, you know, I, I work with each of the chakras as far as the psychological significance. And when couples can learn how to move from the heart level, which isn't the ultimate. I mean, the ultimate is, you know, you're uh, in the crown of the third eye. But right. once they learn how to shift into that, then they can begin the practice. Um, so, so 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 it sounds to me. Let, let me ask you this question: uh, the the, peop, the the people who come to you is it normally the woman who comes to you first? Uh, it's all it's all different. So um, so there's no real lack of sex will compel men to want to get into sex therapy. I'm I'm a psychologist by the way, and a marriage and family therapist. So people right. come to me for a lot of different things, but I'm known for the specialty. But they will look me up, and I'm all over the internet, so they'll find okay, she's a sex therapist, and so often men are very motivated. Um, I'll bet, yeah. The, the classic lack of desire issue, but I also see the reverse, where the man has lost his desire and the woman is really upset with it. Right. So um, it's really, you know, women tend to utilize therapy more as, as a rule, but when you're working with this modality, um, I see both both men and women motivated. Not only do, do women tend to to, uh, to seek therapy more readily than men, but I, I've uh, observed that as, as far as spirituality is concerned, mm-hmm. women are certainly there first yes. and, and, and in larger numbers. Yes. When I talk about spiritual sex in audiences, women will say, where are the men who <laughs> exactly. want to do this? Where are the guys that want to do this? 
you know, and, and I thank goodness there is a good community. I see uh, some beautiful men out, out here in California anyway right. who are into spiritual seeking. And once they can detach a little bit from, you know, it, it's, it's very impressive. You know, men get aroused very quickly. They have ten times more testosterone. So the genitals tend to take all their attention. Right. And, and to teach them, and Tantra and some of the other spiritual sex traditions do this, to move away from that and actually move the energy through your body. You know, it, you were talking about will earlier. You have to utilize some will. Because Absolutely. Otherwise you were talking about will earlier. You have to utilize some will. Because Absolutely. otherwise you're just back at, you know, let's just get tingly. And that, that's going to be the thing we do. You know, intent and ha- it w- in some place... Some uh, do, do you set some kind of a uh, gosh I don't want to use the word goal but some kind of a of a, of a place a state that we're that you're trying to reach mm-hmm. and, we're and not trying to or, um, or that, that 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 we're looking for well okay there's two kind what I would call the true spiritual sex experiences there's there's two levels one is the third eye level which is very easy it's not easy once you taught yourself to be able to go to the heart, you can move into that level and actually practice what people call sex magic. I okay. call it transformational sex. Right. And I gave a couple of um, simple exercises in the Huffington Post uh, most yes. recent blog. And um, you know, just to make it simple, you can actually imagine this uh, field, uh, this an energetic field, a uh, um, uh, magnetic field that you create, and particularly when you're making love and you're, you're really um, being connected and conscious. Um, you can breathe that in and, and sort of imagine it rejuvenating you, and in fact, it will have that effect. So that's one magical. The other, which has been practiced forever, I think, is at the moment of orgasm, um, bringing in an image of something you desire, something you Absolutely. want, and sending it out into the universe. So the third eye level is something that I think can be developed and practiced. The full-on transcendental experiences where we lose our sense of uh, any physicality and we kind of merge with the universe or, right. you know, all those I saw God kind of experiences. Um, those, I think we can't go into saying, okay, tonight I'm going to have this transcendent experience. Right. They're kind of gifts. You're more likely to have them when you understand how to work with your body, how to connect, how to uh, practice with a partner. And so it is more likely. Most people I know that are writing about spiritual sex, the example is Margot, um, uh, I'm blanking on her name. Yeah, and I think you talk, right. Uh, They have had these experiences sometimes early in their life, and they're like, wow, what was that? And then they go about studying it and wanting to find out. I I tell a story in my own experience where it actually healed me from a very, very severe medical condition. Really? Yeah. I think that that was that was that was part of your story. Yeah, wasn't that's it? the one that's later later. Exactly. In, I that's that story because I, I don't want to make people really weird <laughs> weird out in the very beginning. I understand. Yeah, that one got quoted by <clears throat> by um, my good friend, uh, uh, colleague <clears throat> Christian Northrup. Uh huh. So anyway, it's it's all these possibilities that lead people to wanting to understand it, to create it, to map it, you know, all of these things we try to do, and ultimately it's, it's, it's the kind of thing that's a lifelong. What I love about it is it doesn't matter what age you are. If you have a partner and the two of you are interested in, in um, traveling this way and, and being seekers in all kinds of ways in your life, um, it's available to you. It, you don't have to be, you know, spry and fit. You don't have to have all your plumbing working perfectly. You know, it, it's lifelong. So that brings me back to what my question with you was it women who came to you most, which was going to lead to another another question, and that is how do, you know, we've got, let's say we have a woman who's come to you and she's been married for quite a while and, you know, she and her husband have this pattern, and how does she even begin to speak with him uh, in, in terms that, that uh, attract him to this? I mean, well, I mean, that could usually be. Usually, if they've come to an impasse and it's really not working, um, the the best bet is to get into some kind of uh, sex therapy with somebody who's experienced, because there's a lot of people that say they work with sexuality but aren't certified or, or right. trained. Right. And move into it gently. 
you know, because, hey, honey, I'm really bored with you, and meanwhile, I want to practice spiritual sex, probably isn't going to fly. It's probably not going to work, and, and, and <laughs> I may need to find somebody else, sweetheart. So, uh, no, yeah, I know, no. you're not spiritual enough. So, right. you know, what I love to do is teach couples to work with it and to where they are now able to come from their heart center. Not all the time, but right. at times. And then I begin to introduce gently this sort of fascinating other things you can do with your sexual energy. And most of the time, the guys are pretty interested. <laughs> but, but Once, once you catch their attention initially. Yeah. Right. Well, initially, what they want is to have good sex. Sure. And, you know, so we're working with everybody's needs, and um, I'm well aware that the woman is wanting something, because almost all women really say, I- I'm missing something. I want something more. Right. This, you know, get, a, get it on thing isn't working for me. And guys are all often really baffled because they're like, well, well, you had an orgasm. Isn't that enough? Well, you also talk about what uh, I, I think must be a huge problem about, you know, the great lengths that as men will go to, you know, the first time where we meet a woman to get her in, 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 in this, into, into sexual intercourse. Mm-hmm. Right. And then after marriage, it's like w- we don't expect to have to do that anymore. Right. I don't want to go through all those hoops anymore. And, and, it, and it is the hoops that really start to create the desire with the woman. Am I, am I right? Right, right. Yeah, there needs to be an enticement. There needs to be a seduction. But what I've done with couples is, because the guys are feeling kind of the burden of that, and I, don't, and I think that's a little unfair. Yeah, for sure. But, but the, what happens is they start pointing fingers. Okay, it's your turn to initiate. You know, you must initiate. And that's just so unsexy. But together, they can kind of collude to create um, these moments in time, because a lot of times they have to clear the space, get the kids somewhere, you know, whatever it takes. Right. And so it's a co-creative process, and that's what I, I help couples learn to do. So we, we collude together to make the time and space for this to happen, rather than it's your turn, though, it's your turn. And then for women, often desire follows the sense of connectedness and so on. Right. Because women will say, I don't feel any interest in sex. And what they're saying is, I don't feel that tingly thing that I used to feel in the beginning of the relationship. And I would tell them, don't worry about that. It, that will come with touch and with connecting and so on. Um, the intention is what you need. It's okay. intentional sex, really, when you think right. about it. Right, right. I so, didn't know Napoleon Hill mentioned it. <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, it, well, and I, I had just gotten into the real estate business at the time, and I really utilized that. It was, oh, and yeah. It, yeah, it worked absolutely well for me. And since then, I've, I've found it in other, in other works, and that, that energy still works for me today. I, mean, I can use it in a lot of uh-huh. different ways. Yeah, many. you can access it. You know where to find it, and, and you can move the energy. I know, it's really cool. There's absolutely. a couple of interesting books that, that um, I have recommended often one of them is a book called don juan and the art of sexual ecstasy and it's uh, by a woman named marilyn tunisende and uh-huh. she talks about that energy and how to raise it and um it's, it's probably even out of print now but it's a lovely book and she's she's coming from the nagual totec right so is she when she's talking about ta- don juan is she talking about the same don, don juan uh, okay <laughs> great because that was one of the, he was you know, that was one of my teachers, so I, I couldn't hardly wait for the next book to come out right, in that right, whole right. series. Yeah, they, right. they were real popular. And, and the book isn't about sex with Don Juan. Um, right. I thought it was, but it's certainly not. <laughs> right. No, no. But it is, it is that tradition and their views on sexuality. So that's just one example of a completely different paradigm, and that's what I'm interested in is helping people get out of this very limited, in my opinion, boring paradigm. And, and move to some really interesting... I mean, my feeling is that the way we view sex in this culture, which is positions and intercourse and all that, is maybe a tenth of what is really possible. Well, one of the things, uh, uh, Linda, with our audience, is we, we specifically you know, attract people who are on a spiritual journey, looking mm-hmm. to enhance their spirituality. And so for them to be able to find a way to bring their sexuality to play in that, to find oh, those higher places, it's, it's, it's very interesting. The, we, had, uh, we have had a, a high amount of people who have told us that they, they, you know, through our invitations, they plan to be tuned in this evening, and a great deal of interest has been uh, generated. Oh, good. One of the, you know, what, Linda, one of the things that you talk about, and boy, I, I, this is, I think I see this as being a huge, huge problem and and you say that 
that sexuality and self-esteem, low self-esteem, is a is a big problem in this. Mm -hmm. and, and 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 how does that play is in, in in your mind? How does self-esteem play, and what do you do about it as far as working with um, couples? Okay, so that's about five-hour answer. So I let's thought. Give you the short uh, I thought. I mean, self-esteem is at the at the base of an awful lot of what goes on with people's depression, anxiety, etc. But sexuality is one of those areas where we are most vulnerable. And even men that think they're kind of studly can get very insecure about performance. Oh, absolutely. Not women, yeah. and, and the book I wrote is directed at women because we come from a less than, you know, the culture sees women's sexuality as less than. Absolutely. You know, I, we don't I, want it enough. We don't like the way men do it. We don't this, that, and the other. And so um, for women, it's a whole lot and it's a whole lot of that's why I talk about the divine feminine because women need to get their wholeness and they need to really claim the way sex is working for them not a performance to please a man right and it takes a lot of courage to do that but um, it, it, it turns out uh, and often women will write to me and tell me the book did it on its own that it, it, it had enough information for them to feel empowered to feel that the way they like sex works wonderfully for them, and now they know that, you know. Well, you know, in reading the book, I can see that, that that's a, a more than just a real possibility, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah and it wasn't, you know, men's way, women's way. I'm not trying to create a, a, a dissonance between the two. Right. But what men really want is a woman who comes to the table with a clear idea of her own sexuality. I hear this from men so much. And, and they don't, they can't figure it out. They're not in a woman's body. You know? we, we have no yeah, we have no real idea at all. Yeah, and by the way, I'm using heterosexual examples, but the truth is the same model works for same-sex couples just as well. I work a lot with same-sex couples, so I'm um, sure it would. Yeah. I, forgive me for using the male-female examples, but that that's the easiest way to to talk. And right. So, self-esteem is at the base of awful lot of our mental health issues, and I believe sexuality is one of our biggest wounded places. And this culture, particularly in America, is hugely wounded because of Puritan values, because, unfortunately, it's been made into this precious gem that women should never do and then suddenly get turned on, now you're married. And I see so many cases of women that um, felt terrible about any sexual exploration in their maiden years, got married, and now they're supposed to enjoy it, and they just can't get there. And so this whole lie about you save sex for marriage and all of it is just so based on um, a premise about purity and about, oh, it just, it makes me sad. It just really makes me sad. Well, you see this, if, if from my viewpoint, this, this, when you talk about self-esteem and how it affects sexuality, from my experience and what I understand is that at the root of every addict alcoholic problem lies this low self-esteem. Yes, yeah. but it's, it's, it's such a generic term that, you know, you need to walk a mile in somebody's shoes before it, it, it is specific enough to make sense. It, it's, a, it's a very big catch-all word. <laughs> well, I, I, I totally agree. But, yeah. but, but in, in the process of, of uh, which, which, which leads me to believe that this, this problem uh, runs a lot deeper than just our sexuality with the self-esteem part of it. Yes, I mean, it's... <laughs> We're yeah. holistic beings, so let's face it, everything is all interconnected. A absolutely, absolutely. As, know, a, as a matter of fact, you, you say that, that, that this low self-esteem is the core of depression. Oh, absolutely. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all mental health issues, with the exception of um, people who have brain disorders like schizophrenia and so on, that's right. a different issue. You know, you, you mentioned that there's a lot of speakers that are tuned in uh, to the show, and one of the things that was true in the 70s and why I chose celibacy is that the idea that you should go off and meditate on a mountain was still very strong in terms of what's spiritual, and this split between our spirituality and our baser instincts, our, you know, that's been going on for several, well, actually since Augustine's time, but Absolutely. the idea that sexuality and spirituality were never separated. There's no reason to separate them. So to have a partner and experience this ecstatic sex is as spiritual as it gets. Well, well, don't you think that the, this 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 problem of of uh, of spiritual being separated is it's like 
There, there's a, a saying goes around that I'm a spiritual being having a human experience. Right, right, right. Which, which is kind of a, it's in my estimation, is pretty misleading. You know, the, the, the truth is I'm a spiritual human. There, you know, right. there's that combination. Right. And if I'm already spiritual, why am I so focused on being spiritual when maybe what I need to focus on is, is bring, bringing my humanity to my spirituality? Yeah, being, the, being the best human you can be and operating on the laws of attraction. Absolutely. And, and that, to me, I found is it's my journey. It's about being the best human being that I can be. And when I do that, my spirituality starts to fall in place or yeah. probably already was there. It's inside. It's it's in within us. You know, that it's not out there anywhere. Right. Exactly. And it's. And it's that's why it's so wonderful to bring the body completely into that picture. You know, it's not denying the body. See, that's a lot of the reli- the, the so-called major religions in the world got into this denying the body thing, and it's sad. It was somebody's idea of how to be more spiritual, and I believe, and this is going to maybe offend some people, that because men had a hard time sort of not thinking about sex, it, it became more uh, possible to, you know, reach some state if they, they didn't have sexual stuff to, to worry about. And I think it's sad because um, well, it's, it's, it's very sad. cutting it's off half your body, in my opinion. <laughs> You know, one of the things that's going to happen to us is I, I, I we're going to we're going to run out of time long before we run out of things to talk about. I just uh, I would like to have had a two-hour show with you, uh, Linda. It's like oh, that'd be great. Yeah, and, and believe me, folks, if 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 you're even thinking about uh, uh, spirituality and sex and bringing them together, reclaiming goddess sexuality, and, and I'll tell you what, whether you're male or female, it's, it's a good read. I, I I learned a lot from it. Let, let's do talk a minute about, because uh, I think this is a huge issue. You, you talk about the female's magnetic power of attraction. Mm-hmm. But before we go there, tell us about Lila and, and where all this stuff really began to go wrong. Um, you mean where women became impressed? Is that what we're talking about? Well, yeah, we're talking about, I, I, I think Lila th- was uh, Adam's first wife as far as uh, Jewish mysticism yeah, was concerned. Lilith, yeah. And Lilith, I'm sorry, right. Argument, lots of people want it. You know, all of those are myths. They're all exactly. stories. But um, when we go back before the more recent creation stories, um, God was a woman. Absolutely. Because the power of giving birth was the most incredible power that humans had. Right. You know. So uh, who knows? I mean, I pondered this many years, uh, why it was there was such a huge backlash against women. But... Somewhere at the time, and they actually, there's historical records of how this all came about. The Chalice and the Blade, which is the... Right, I read that a long time ago. Yeah, she she compiled a lot of those um, uh, historical information. But basically, these uh, herding cultures, the sort of the Tilla, the Hun people, came and crushed the old uh, European cultures that were uh, very peaceful, for the most part, and agrarian. Right. Where the goddess would worship people... um, nature, the cycles of nature is what people saw and what people understood and, and tuned into. So these herding cultures come along with very angry sky gods as their image and you know, they sort of, first they crushed the cultures and then they intermarried and all of that. So little by little, and there was a period of time where the goddess was still revered as the way to become legitimate, you know, the priestess or the goddess, and then little by little, women became um, more and more uh, pushed into you're either a wife or you're a courtesan, and those are your choices, and then women were limited more and more and more, and the children were no longer considered theirs, but, but the father's. And they and women started to be seen as chattel or property. As chattel, exactly as chattel, and in the Old Testament they are. Right. And, um, and so the issue was we need to, a property became something we owned, you know, the individual owned as opposed to communal. Right. And so I'm going to pass off my on my property, you know, as the king or the whoever. I need to know that that child that she bore is actually my child. Now, that was a fairly complicated issue. Right. <laughs> Very. So the whole virginity and marrying girls at 14 and uh, displaying blood at the, you know, after the wedding night and all of those horrible traditions that went on for centuries. Right. Became, an, you know, it's like to now, to this day, they still will murder girls in um, certain countries for not being virgin. Absolutely. The family will murder them. Yeah, absolutely. It's, so it's that craziness around 
have to be untouched, et cetera, et cetera, only came in at a time when legitimacy had to go through the male instead of the female. Up until then, we had matrilineal cultures, and, and there was no big, you know, there was no such thing as a bastard. Okay, when you say matrilineal, you're talking about the exact opposite of the patriarchal. No, 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 because that would be matriarchal. Matriarchal, I mean. Matrilineal is simply that the bloodline, the inheritance, everything comes through the mother's Okay, line. I'm okay. I got yeah. it. All right, and and it, it makes sense because then there's no question about who the mother is. You know? Ab- absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that. so, you know, I guess we had to go through this awful time. You know, women were burned and, and, and you know, vilified in every way possible, and treated badly, and um, I'm glad to be a female at this time because we're just now coming out of a true dark age time where women are now seen as having souls who are actually being allowed to be educated. I mean, things that even 100 years ago were impossible. Well, you know, for for some of the damage that happened in the 60s because of drugs, many other really good things came, right. you know, came out of that. That's right. So, so that brings us to this idea of the, the magnetic... Uh, power of attraction with females. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, when I read that, the power of attraction with females. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, when I read that, the thing that I that 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 made me think of is the fear that that must that that can cause in, in a male, especially if oh, it's yeah. especially it's if it's horrible. misused, especially if it's misused. Yeah, and and so all of these crazy things that happen with men who are toppled from you know high places because they couldn't resist you know some. Absolutely. Some girl in their office. You know, the thing is, it doesn't have to be dangerous. It was seen as dangerous because sex and um, who your heir was became such a big issue. Right. But uh, cultures like the Polynesian cultures that allowed, uh, you know, teens of a certain age to explore and enjoy, the dynamic energy of the male and the magnetic energy of the female was honored and celebrated, and it wasn't, you know, nobody was taking anybody for a ride, but when right. the whole issue of celibacy and, you know, save yourself till marriage and all of that came so big, the idea that you are, that men feel so compelled, there's, there's countless stories of men whose lives were ruined because they couldn't, you know, hold themselves back from, and therefore did things, including rape. Still happening today. To, today, yeah. Absolutely. Now, I, I think that, I believe that at the heart of it, Men are incredibly spiritual, beautiful beings, and that the culture has, and I'm talking about several thousand years, has made a, um, uh, a, a, a icon of the, the superhero. Yes, absolutely. You know, the, the male who's cut off from his emotions, and he can go kill everybody, and he can go off, and he can add, and, and then he rapes, you know, when he wins the war. And, you know, all of that is, is a hyper image that I don't believe is the true male. The male with the broad shoulders that can deal with everything in right. the great protector, and, yes. And, could care less about anything and, you know, kills and all that. Right. So, you know, I think both men and women have been, you know, kind of ruined by a, a lot of these ideas, and, and we're coming into a time where the idea of a co-equal partnership, a true partnership, which to me is where the magic is. I, I, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that that's the, the case. Yeah, and that's emerging just in our time, and I feel like I'm on the leading edge along with other people in my field are also – uh, marriage and family people, because as we work for that, and all the things we're teaching, communication skills and so on, are a way of making things equal, not same, because men and women need to be very different. I mean, that's the fun part, but you cannot demean the other half of your relationship without demeaning yourself. A- absolutely. There's there no way possible. Yeah. I'll tell you what, we're going we're gonna to start running out of time here. we got about seven or eight minutes left. Excuse me. And what I, I would like to get into half a dozen things, but one, I, let's talk about intuition and the the role that you know when you when you when you when we talk about intuition, uh, and, and your point in here was so uh, poignant and so w- well taken. One of the things I've observed is, is that if you look at uh, at intuition and in, in women who are, you'll find women are there. You don't talk about intuition. Particularly older women. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and males are starting, to, you know, uh, like in the last 20 years have, you know, we, we, you know, we've started to understand that we too have intuition that's available to us. But you, you point out a really specific reason why a woman is more inclined to uh, learn about her intuitive nature 
uh, whereas men don't have that same ability. And that is uh, that I believe you say that women's natural aware, naturally aware of what's going on in their body. Right, body wisdom. A absolutely. Mm -hmm. So they go within. And, and going within is, is sort of a metaphor for a lot of things. You know, from the very earliest time when a woman gets her first period, she needs to be aware of what's happening. Men tend to be very external. They're looking for out there. And, and so things like vision quests that the Native Americans did, you know, they had to put men on mountains and leave them without water and food and all that. Right. Because it had to scare them into their feminine. That's without, really without, why they did all that. Without even realizing that they were being scared into their feminine. Yeah, well, they probably didn't have that language, but right. we all have masculine feminine, and one of the feminine aspects is intuition, awareness, and uh, the surrender, you know, that, that, I, that I use that, that word a lot. So women do healing quests, and they don't starve themselves, and they don't scare themselves, but they give themselves the time to drop into their intuition. But for men, it, it takes a little more effort. But it all has to do with trusting the aspect of the self that is the feminine. A actually, I, 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 I've been, I was blessed with this, this intuitive understanding mm -hmm. about 27 or 28 years ago. That's great. And I made a conscious decision that I was going to bring that intuition into all into all of my decision-making processes, and I was going to allow it to mm -hmm. guide me. And I'll tell you the truth, Linda, it's taken me to some pretty strange places that I would never have gone to otherwise. <laughs> but as I look back on my journey, which you talk about a lot, mm -hmm. it begins to make a great deal of sense why I did this, why I did that, and, and, and as far as where I'm at today. Yeah, it's, to me, the most important GPS system we have. Right. Uh, it, well, it, it's definitely a GPS system. Uh, and well worth, and I'll tell you what, if there are males out there who aren't connected to your intuition, uh, definitely, uh, you know, find your way into some books, some understanding, uh, some kind of uh, a teacher's because it's, until you're there, until you pick up that part of yourself, we're not whole. We can't reach a wholeness. That's right. W without bringing that part and of it together. And it has to do with being cut off from the feminine. I think we've got about... <laughs> Four minutes left. Uh, okay. Well, you and, mentioned my website. <laughs> and, Tom, and Tom will be shutting us down here shortly. So, uh, and uh, let's talk about your website, and then uh, maybe we can just give a, a real quick, and I know this is asking a lot, uh, about the maiden mother and crone, if you would. What, and your website? Yeah, it's goddesstherapy.com, G O D D E S S T A C R A P Y.com. Lots of articles on there so you can learn more about uh, how I do what I do. You can also sign up for a newsletter that I send out eight times a year. And my uh, Huffington Post um, a blog on spiritual sex is in the living section under my name, Linda E. Savage. And um, that's the best way to get a hold of me is go to my website and you can email me. So, uh, Maiden Mother, Wise Woman. <laughs> right. Uh, I use the word crone in my book. I love the name. It means wise woman, but a lot of women have a terrible time because such bad press has been given to the name crone. Well, yeah, it's got a lot of baggage with it, that old crone. And and noses and, you know, yeah. cackling witches and all that. You know, but, but in any case, there are the three natural stages of every woman's life. Some women do not choose to give birth or, or cannot in this lifetime. Right. And so there's other ways that they develop that mother energy. But maiden refers to from the first period till you either give birth or you shift into something that allows you to be mothering in some way. Right. And it doesn't refer to having a hymen. You never should have. That whole hymen frenzy is crazy. Pretty amazing that that ever come in. in yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and that we would kill somebody for not having one. is uh, unconscionable. But yeah. anyway. And then the wise woman is a very long, protracted transitional time. You know, you have the transition into motherhood. You have nine months. And then you have this initiation experience called childbirth, which is a very powerful spiritual experience. Absolutely. And then you have what we call perimenopause now, which could be up to 10 years of a lot of changes in the body. And if women use their wisdom, their inner body wisdom, and find the herbs, find the way, find what's right for them, all of that learning then leads them to be amazingly more intuitive and, in fact, psychic. A lot of women's psychic abilities develop at um, postmenopause. Part of it is based on uh, the elevated FSH, you know, hormone, but we won't go into that. But uh, because we actually smell, we have a sharper sense of smell, a sharper sense of hearing, all of that gets more. 
so the reason that women were always traditionally wise women is because they actually had more powers to to pick up and dispense things at that particular time. Right. You know what? We are totally out of time. totally <laughs> out of time. I'm going to have to let you go. Uh, I, I'm going to look at having you back at some t- some point in the future, and I definitely would like to talk with you about a male counterpart. But sure. listen, thank you for taking an hour out of your evening and, and sharing I with us. For my modem not working. <laughs> ah, it, it's the, it, technical stuff, you know. It's like that that stuff happens all the time. So right. we were just glad to have you and your voice and your wisdom. So you you have a good evening, and thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, George. I'll look forward to talking to you again. Absolutely. Bye bye. So, believe me, reclaiming goddess sexuality, give it a try. I I promise you that you will love it. Next week, am I possessed? Uh, Great topic. I think you'll have a good time. Um, Tuesday night, 9 o'clock, next week, be sure and come back. In the meantime, don't forget to accentuate the positive and have a fantastic week. Thank you.